is the author of American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama. Please join me in welcoming Rachel L. Swarns to the Baltimore Book Festival. Thank you all for coming. I've got to get a little closer, I think, to this mic. Can everyone hear me? Yes, in the back? Well, I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got started on this project, um, what I found, and I'll read a little bit as well. Um, but then I'm hoping that you guys will have some questions because it's always more fun if we're talking to each other and I'm not just talking to you. <laughs> So anyway, um, as, as you heard, I've done a lot of things at the New York Times, and um, this book emerged out of my time covering the First Lady. And that was something, frankly, of an unusual assignment. Um, at the New York Times and at papers like the New York Times, we don't typically have a person assigned to covering the First Lady. Usually that is a job that's done by the White House correspondents who chase the president around on Air Force One or in the briefing rooms, and they cover the first family and the first lady in bits and pieces when they can, when they have time. Um, but there was a sense this time um, that we should do something differently. Journalists, like we like to think of ourselves as writing the first draft of history. And there was a sense among people at the times that uh, this family, this first African-American family, living in this house, this white house, built in part by slave labor, uh, was going to be written about for generations to come, and that we should have a role in documenting that. And so that's how it was that my editor said, you know, would you be interested in covering uh, Michelle Obama? And I said, yes. <laughs> and um, so this, this book emerged out of an article, and what happened was, was very early on, it was in January, in fact, right around Inauguration Day, we were working on an article about the president and his Rainbow family. And at the very, very last minute, as journalists are wont to do, we decided, oh my goodness, we don't know anything about Michelle's ancestry. So we found a genealogist and asked her to do a little digging in the First Lady's family tree. And of course, being journalists, we were rushing and we didn't give her enough time. So she found a little bit of stuff, not a whole lot. And um, the story ran mostly about the president and his family and, and that was that, or so we thought. What we didn't know was that this genealogist was hooked and she spent the next months digging, digging, digging. And in September of that first year that the Obamas were in the White House, she called us back and she said, you know, I think I have found something pretty remarkable. Uh, would you guys be interested in working with me, writing something about this story? And as you can imagine, we were interested. And so I ended up getting on a plane, flying to Birmingham, Alabama, where I was digging through the archives, um, knocking on church doors, trying to find anyone and anything about a man by the name of Dolphus Shields, the First Lady's great-great-grandfather, who was biracial. And what we ended up with in October of 2009 was a remarkable story that the First Lady didn't even know herself. It was a story of Melvinia, the First Lady's great-great-great-grandmother, who was the mother of this Dolphus Shields that I was chasing down in Birmingham. And Melvinia was a slave girl, valued at $475 in 1852. And the story was also about her great, great, great grandfather, who was a white man, whose identity was a mystery. And so we wrote this story. Um, it ran on the front page of the New York Times. Um, there was a lot of um, attention. And in fact, the very next day, I got an email uh, from a publisher at HarperCollins, an editor actually, who said, oh wow, that's really interesting, um, but it's kind of a tiny snippet of Michelle Obama's family tree. This was her mother's line. Uh, Would you be interested in writing a book about the First Lady's family tree, like all of it? 
And um, to be honest, my initial reaction was absolutely not. <laughs> I have never written a book before. I have young children. I have a mortgage. How, how would I fund such a thing? Um, and uh, my husband told me, wait, please don't tell that lady no. And he reminded me of what I told him when I came back from that trip to Birmingham. I had spent several hours uh, looking for Dolphus Shields' tombstone. And Dolphus, you'll remember, is the First Lady's great-great-grandfather. And as many of you may know, that uh, back in the 50s and before, even the dead were segregated in the South. And so I was searching through this old, neglected cemetery uh, where many African Americans in Birmingham had been buried over the years very neglected with grass up to my knees, looking armed with those records from the archives that told me exactly where his plot should be and where the tombstone should be, and I'm standing there and none of it is making sense. And um, at the end of that, utterly unsuccessful search, and if there are any genealogists or amateur genealogists in the room, you know that that's somehow what it's like. At the end of that afternoon, I stood there and thought to myself, there's nothing I'd rather be doing than digging through the nation's history in this way. And so I listened to my husband, and I said yes. And in 2010, um, I got started. And it was quite um, an ambitious undertaking. I didn't know where the stories would lead me. I basically had done this article about, you know, the First Lady's maternal line, um, but didn't know much about her other ancestors or where they, uh, where they were or where, they, where their stories fit into her family picture. And so I started traveling. And I traveled all over the country. Um, her ancestors are scattered uh, throughout the South, South Carolina, Georgia, Birmingham, North Carolina, Virginia, as well as um, in the North, Chicago, Ohio, Michigan, New Jersey. And I spent a lot of time in the archives, a lot of time in libraries, a lot of time in courthouses, and I like to blame my reading glasses now on trying to decipher that 19th century script, not my age. And what I discovered was really um, you know, an amazing story, a very American story. Um, the First Lady's ancestors were African Americans who toiled in vast rice plantations in South Carolina and on smaller farms in Georgia. They were mixed race people who lived free for decades before the Civil War. They were Irish Americans who nurtured their dreams in a new land and fought for the Confederacy. And uh, the First Lady had always suspected that she had white ancestors hidden somewhere in her family tree, but she had no idea who or when or where or how they fit into her story. And what I was able to do uh, was use DNA testing, 21st century technology to solve a 19th century mystery. And what I found was, which was not so surprising, in fact, very, very, the most ordinary of American stories was that her white ancestors were um, the members of uh, Melvinia's owner's family. They were the Shields family, um, an Irish-American family that arrived here sometime in the 1700s. Uh, the family history goes that they fought, uh, one of them, uh, Andrew Shields fought in the Revolutionary War. But they were, not, um, they were not the kind of people I had in mind, or I think that many Americans have in mind when they think of slave owners. Um, and her life was quite different, I think, from what we might imagine that um, life would be like for African Americans who were enslaved. The Shields family, um, they were struggling people. In fact, when I tracked down their descendants, many of them had no idea that they had slaves in the family because they had no idea that the Shields could ever have owned anything 
um, at all. In fact, one woman told me, you know, I was always told that the Shieldses never had two nickels to rub together. Um, but what happened was, was that they, one man, uh, Henry Wells Shields, working in South Carolina, married uh, the daughter of a wealthy family. And when his father-in-law died, he inherited three slaves, including uh, Michelle Obama's great, great, great grandfather. So there is that story in this book and in her family tree. But there are also amazing women, which might not be a surprise since she's a fairly extraordinary woman herself. Her, Melvinia, for one, the great, great, great grandmother, after slavery, she moved her family a bit north and managed remarkably to reunite with some of the people she grew up with on the farm in, in South Carolina. She was, after her master died, she was shipped down to his daughter's little farm in Georgia and was separated from everything she knew when she was a little girl. And somehow, as an adult, after slavery ended, at a time when people were desperately trying to find children, wives, brothers, sisters who had been sold off or sent off uh, to different places, she managed to find her friends. Perhaps they were her relatives, we're not sure. And it was quite a remarkable reunion. Her son, Dolphus, ended up marrying the daughter of one of these, uh, the women that she knew from that early, her early days in South Carolina. There was also the First Lady's great-great-grandmother on her father's side, a woman by the name of Mary Moten. And Michelle Obama likes to talk about, describe herself as a South Side girl, and she is in fact, of course, born and raised in Chicago, as were her parents. Um, but her family had no idea how deep, how very, very deep in Illinois those roots were. And Mary, the First Lady's great, 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 I'm sorry, two greats, great, great grandmother, arrived in Illinois in the 1860s. She ran away from slavery with a husband and a, a little girl from Kentucky and arrived in Chicago, not Chicago, Southern Illinois, which was really then the promised land for uh, people in that area. It was a free state and arrived there sometime between 1860, in the probably early 60s, 1863, 1865. And uh, Mary's daughter, who was the First Lady's great grandmother, was also a remarkable woman. Her name was Phoebe. And when you're doing this kind of research and spending so much time with uh, people who have lived a long time, you end up having your favorites among them. Sometimes we do, even in our own, when we dig in our own uh, family trees. And I loved Phoebe. Phoebe was born in 1879. She was a sharecropper's daughter. But somewhere along the way, she decided that that life was not for her. She was not going to ha live the farming life. And in f the span of four years, in I'm sorry, in a span of uh, about 10 years, eight years, in her 20s, she went to four different cities, uh, becoming among the first in the First Lady's family to see the skyscrapers of Chicago in 1908. So you have a really rich um, tapestry of families and connections uh, in the First Lady's ancestry. But what I realized as I was doing um, this digging, this research, was that it was more than just the story of one interesting family. It really was and is, in many ways, the story of who we are, many of us right here, and, and this country that we live in. And the First Lady's family had front row seats to some of the most remarkable moments in our history. Uh, slavery, emancipation, um, the Civil War before that, Reconstruction, the migration, and I realized, too, that this lingers and um, resonates in many of our lives today. And one of the things that was most interesting to me was talking to the descendants, the people who are living today, um, distant cousins, black and white, and in between of the First Lady, who are wrestling with this inheritance that they have, this most unexpected connection to the White House. And many of the descendants of the White Shields family that own the First Lady's great-great-great-grandmother and who are also the First Lady's relatives themselves, many of these descendants um, have struggled with this information and with this knowledge. It's not easy, as you might imagine, to have someone knock on your door and say, by the way, 
your family owned the First Lady's family. That's something um, that is a little unsettling, would be for most people. Um, but even, even more surprising and more unsettling than that is just the unknowns and the questions that we have about uh, what happened to Melvinia. And of course, we know that she had a biracial child, the First Lady's great-great-grandfather. And we know, too, that this was a time when rape was a very common occurrence on farms and plantations um, in our country. And so wrestling with that kind of history, that um, difficult, hard history, has been difficult for members of the First Lady's family, white and black. Some of the um, white distant cousins who are alive today didn't want anything to do with this at all. Um, they, didn't want, um, they didn't want their names in the book. They didn't want to be interviewed. They kind of wanted the dead left to the dead. Um, and then there were those, though, who were willing and uh, wanted actually to know. And they thought that it may be that this is hard history for us to wrestle with, but it is our history. And so there were a number of people who, uh, one woman in particular, her name is Joan Triple, who went on this journey uh, with me, along with uh, another uh, relative of the First Lady, um, a black woman by the name of Jewel Barkley. And they were both willing to say, we want to know, and it matters, and it's who we are. And so they dug through their own memories, their own records, and um, the story of the living, I think, and how we deal with and grapple with um, our history is as important part of our story, I think, as the history itself. And so that was a really fascinating portion of this book, too. And for the First Lady's um, African-American relatives, it was not easy, too. You know, many of them knew people who should have known or they thought would have known about slavery and about these times. Her uncle told me that he often asked uh, his elders, well, what, what do we know about um, you know, that time in slavery, about our enslaved ancestors, about all this racial mixing that's clearly in some of our families? And he said people simply didn't want to talk about it. One of the most amazing finds um, in this research was I was able to find people, two people, who knew Melvinia, the First Lady's great, great, great grandmother. And that is remarkable when you consider that Melvinia was born in 1844. Um, but she lived a long life. They have good genes in that family. Um, and she died um, in 1938. And I found uh, the woman who married her grandson, who also lived a long time, and a neighbor. Uh, Melvinia, later in her life, ended up being a midwife. And one of the people she brought into this world uh, was a neighbor of hers, and he also lived a very long life. And they were able to talk to me a little bit about uh, what her last years were like. And what they told me was that it was very clear they knew Melvinia, they knew also her son Dolphus, who was, Melvinia was a brown-skinned woman, Dolphus was a very, very fair-skinned man, and he had a brother named Henry as well, who was also very fair. And they knew that there was no father or husband in the picture, um, but no one asked, and people didn't talk about it, and she didn't talk about it. And so um, the silence continued really on both sides of the family. I'm going to read a little bit, um, and then I will be happy to take some questions. But of course, we are in Baltimore, so I should talk a little bit about the First Lady's uh, roots here. So um, as I mentioned, she had uh, ancestors scattered all across the South. And they moved north, like many African Americans did during the migration. But her family moved very, very early. As I told you about her um, great-great-grandmother who got to Illinois in 1860s and to Chicago, these ancestors in the early 1900s. Um, on the East Coast, um, some of the North Carolina relatives started moving, too, in the very uh, early 1900s. And um, the woman who ended up raising her grandmother left North Carolina at a time when um, the state was stripping uh, African Americans of their rights. And uh, at that time, they moved north, went straight past Washington, D.C. Their destination was this city. And 
I don't know how well you know your history. Um, I didn't know this history, but Baltimore was, uh, I think, the fourth largest city at the time. And it, the port drew people from all around the world. Um, immigrants, um, Southerners, um, and for her ancestors, it was a great aunt whose name was Carrie Coleman. It was a remarkable change um, compared to what they were used to. They lived on, I'm going to mispronounce it, but I think it's Asquith Street, okay, um, in the early 1900s, sometime around 1907. And it was a time when there were, you know, black members of the city council, there was a, uh, a lively black press. Um, it would have been um, a very exciting place for a young woman from North Carolina to be living for a time because Michelle Obama's ancestors, these Coleman's, also lived during the time where formal segregation was really taking hold and becoming legalized in this city. And sometime around, somewhere between 1915 and 1918, they moved on. And um, there are bad things happening in, South, in North Carolina, and I'm still not sure what happened, but. Uh, Michelle Obama's grandmother's parents died and Carrie uh, Coleman uh, took uh, that little girl and somehow they ended up in Chicago. Um, perhaps it was Carrie's husband who had a brother who went from North Carolina to West Virginia to Chicago which was kind of a common route and maybe that was how they ended up there but um, they did stay in Baltimore for a tiny bit. I'm going to read a little bit from the book um, just to speak to this part of the history that I found so interesting about how enormously varied the experience during slavery really was and how this notion of um, the grand plantation and gone with the wind was so, so different from the experience of Mr. Michelle Obama's ancestors and for many African Americans. The southern plantation is a fixture of the American imagination. Close your eyes and you can almost see it. The grand white manor with its ornate columns, the sweeping expanse of green clover, the stately magnolias filling the warm spring breezes with their sweet perfume. Some conjure up visions of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello his 5,000-acre mountain estate in Virginia with its 43 rooms, eight fireplaces, and 200 slaves. Others invoke Scarlett O'Hara's mythical mansion in Gone with the Wind, which bustled with the clink of fine china and silver and the comings and goings of the housemaids and more than 100 enslaved laborers. That fabled mansion stood near Jonesboro, Georgia, only about five miles from the farm where Melvinia ended up sometime around 1852, when she was only about eight years old. And I'm going to interrupt here just to remind you that um, Melvinia, the First Lady's great-great-great-grandmother, um, was torn away from everyone she knew when her master died in, in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And so she was shipped to this part of Georgia when she was just a child. Melvinia's new home, situated in the state's rough up country, of Georgia was nothing like those vast plantations that often come to mind. She never knew that kind of life. When Melvinia arrived in 1852, she stepped into a place of dirt roads and neglected bridges, a community of plain and unassuming people, according to observers, who raised their families in log cabins or rough-hewn cottages. The fields were filled with white men, many of them illiterate or nearly so, who handled the backbreaking labor of planting, plowing, and harvesting corn, wheat, and cotton on their own. It was the kind of place that many wealthy Southerners dismissed as backward and provincial. Archibald T. Burke, a slave owner who settled in the region around the same time that Melvinia did, worried that his wealthy fiance would be unhappy with his choice of a new home. I am sometimes fearful that you will not be pleased with the society in the upcountry he wrote his bride to be. You will think it strange to see white people living in log cabins, and you will find all sorts of society here except aristocracy. It is unlikely that anyone asked Melvinia her thoughts on the matter, but the little girl might have been startled too when she laid eyes on her new home 
and her new master, Henry Wells Shields. He was a man in his prime, a property owner in his mid-30s and the married patriarch of a growing clan that already included eight children. Yet he, like the other white yeoman farmers in the county, worked the land with his own hands. He had never owned a slave in his life. There is no record of this first encounter between Melvinia and Henry, between the dark-eyed slave girl and her new white master. There is no way to know whether Henry felt at a loss at that moment, uncertain of his bearings as he looked at this young child suddenly thrust into his care, or whether he had been eagerly waiting praying for this day to come. Born in South Carolina, Henry had been trying for at least four years to carve out a future for himself in the rocky middling soil in upcountry Georgia. Melvinia's arrival completely transformed his prospects. He was now, suddenly, a member of the county elite, the tiny privileged class of men who owned human property. As for Melvinia, she was forced to adjust to a completely new existence. She had been a little girl nurtured in a bustling community of African Americans. Now she would be one of only three black slaves in a sea of white faces. Once the favorite slave of a wealthy family, she was now the prized possession of a farmer still struggling to make a name for himself. No matter how much or how little she knew about Henry that day she stood before him in Georgia, she certainly understood that her fate and her future and her very survival rested in the hands of a man who was still learning how to be a master. And so that gives you a bit of a sense of what life was like, and that was something new to me in terms of my um, knowledge as a layperson of what slavery uh, in this country was like. And it obviously had many, many forms. She, she does, uh, the First Lady does have um, ancestors who lived in South Carolina on the vast, the really vast, with hundreds of slaves, so really her ancestors en encapsulate um, a large part of this history. Um, I am going to uh, take some questions, but I should tell you um, that one of the surprising things um, that happened after the book came out, which was that um, I got an email from a guy who said, oh my goodness, I, I think that you know my family is part of that Shields family. I had written an article about, um, about the book, and he'd, his wife had seen it and said, aren't those Shields's our Shields's? And um, he actually had, remarkably, a photo of Henry Wells Shields um, and um, Henry's son, the man who we believe to be the First Lady's great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, um, and he sent that along, um, and it's remarkable to see um, and at the same time, Clayton County, Georgia, where Melvinia lived, decided to erect a monument in her, um, in her memory. And I thought, you know, they were inviting um, some of Melvinia's descendants, and I thought, well, I don't know, maybe some of the White Shields would come, and they did. Um, they came from Georgia, and from, some drove from Alabama. And the two families, um, the descendants of the slave owner and the slave met, um, on the day that they unveiled that memorial. They talked, exchanged numbers, had a meal together. I'm not sure that they will be Facebook friends for years to come. Um, but it was really something to see. And I, I thought um, that uh, it represented for me um, a sense that uh, we can all look back and um, and take the time to look and see and understand our history, even if it is difficult, and to see how we are connected, even if our connections sometimes emerge in painful places. Um, so I want to thank you very much for coming. I have hope that you guys will have some questions. I am here to answer as many as I can. I don't think that'll be a problem at all, <laughs> Rachel. Thank you. Well, as Rachel said, I'm sure I know I have a ton of questions, but that's what I do every day for a living. So I want to give open the floor to all of you. Anyone with questions for Rachel? Okay. Saw her hand first. <laughs> okay. 
just say your name, please, and, and with your question. Sure. Uh, my name is Dana Moore. You mentioned that some of your verification was through DNA, using a 21st century solution for an 18th century problem or 19th. Did the, did, did the first lady submit to DNA testing? And how did that come about? As you can imagine, you don't really go asking the first lady for her DNA. <laughs> Um, so what I did was I knew that her, uh, that Dolphus Shields was her great-great-grandfather, and so I looked for his descendants. And I suspected, um, we suspected when the article came out that um, her great, her white great-great-great-grandfather may have been a member of this family. Melvinia, after the war, um, when she first appears in the census, is living alongside um, her owner's son. And at that time, in 1870, um, in addition to Dolphus, she has uh, two other um, mixed-race children. And, and some of these children were born after the war, when she was a free person. Um, so it looked like perhaps there was, um, it's hard, it's, it's a very difficult thing trying to figure out what these, even relationship or what it was. Um, but some of her, um, the First Lady's family, um, black and white, hope that there was something more there and that this was a, a relationship that continued even if it was one that was forbidden and kept secret. But anyway, I found um, the descendants of um, her owner, Melvinie's owner, and um, Dolphus's descendants, and um, over a long period of time was able to convince enough of them to do DNA testing. And that's where we found a match. I saw your hand up, sir. Uh, What's your name? Don Brock, and uh, I'm a genealogist, so I was just interested, would you say DNA was probably the prime research uh, breakthrough uh, in terms of brick walls? Or, um, I think it, I mean, it does, uh, you know, there would be no way um, for us to have known that the two, the Shields families, black and white, were, were linked otherwise. I mean, who knows, there could be something that comes up. I mean, the, the records were suggestive, um, the White Shields family names, some of them repeat in the Black Shields family. Um, they were living close by, but you know, there would have been no way otherwise to have been able to make that connection. Uh, exactly how many generations back were you able to get back to an immigrant, say? Yeah. Oh, on, on the, um, as, as some of you might know, it's easier uh, for better or worse, to trace the white ancestors and the African American ancestors, because the records are so scarce before, um, uh, you know, the, the Civil War. So on her um, her white ancestor side, I can trace them back very well um, to the early 1800s to a guy by the name of Moses Shields, who was Henry Wells Shields' father. The family has um, their own family stories, of which some of it. Is, seems, you know, there's some documentation that supports it, but it's not conclusive. And their st family story is that um, the Shields, who were once known as O Shields, emigrated in the 1700s, and that this Andrew Shields was the one who came, and that he fought in the Revolutionary War. And indeed, there is an Andrew Shields who did, and there is an Andrew Shields who um, was granted land in Georgia. But I was never able to directly connect Andrew and Moses. so. Other questions? Okay. How you doing? What's your name? Uh, my name is Anita Rosenberg. Um, I've done some family history tracing too, and um, uh, there's a very similar phenomena that happens with uh, those of us who have ancestors and the Holocaust about the wall that goes up about mm. talking about the past. But I just thought I'd mention that. But um, so it touched me uh, mm. a lot. Um, did you uh, relay this information to Mrs. Obama? Was she? Did you introduce her to family members? Or are you allowed to talk about that? Um, unfortunately for me, the first lady does not do book interviews as a matter of policy, which you know makes those of us writing about her very, very frustrated. Um, but her her family helped. Uh, me with my research, and I briefed her staff as I went along, and so um, she wasn't surprised. I gave her books and her staff books and her relatives books. Um, I thought 
they should read it first before you could buy it uh, at the bookstore. Um, and so uh, she does know, I know that her family knows and um, you know what they make of it. I know that there are, some members of her family have, have told me that um, they've really enjoyed it and find it fascinating. I don't know exactly what she thinks, but I hope that she also finds it fascinating. It seems that this would be a valuable thing to be talking about now with the racism that's going on in our country. Why, why wouldn't this, I mean, not why, we know why, but it seems that this would be so humbling for all of us. I think, though, I think the reality is, even though um, I um, think that you're right, and I think that we should all explore and, and uh, look back and confront um, this kind of history and recognize these connections in a political context, slavery, rape, not so easy, and um, the Obamas have been very careful about how they've dealt with talking about race, and I think that it's not, um, I, I could see advisors of, them, of theirs saying, yeah, it's fascinating, uh, wait till uh, after November. <laughs> Great question, thank you. <laughs> you have a question? Hi, yes. I'm wondering if you've had a chance to explore your own history to the same degree that you've explored Mrs. Obama's, considering, I mean, luck of the draw, she happens to be married to the <laughs> president, and it would make me wonder more about, you know, I get to explore this because of who she is. Do I ever get the chance to explore my own as much right. or somebody else's as yeah. much? Yeah. Great question. It is a great question. And actually, what I loved most about I wrote this book, obviously, because I was writing about the First Lady and because she is in the White House. But what I loved most about her ancestors were how ordinary they were. Um, you know, they were farmers and sharecroppers and porters and carpenters and domestics and postal clerks. And um, I think so many of us, you know, they kind of moved their way forward bit by bit and fell back and kept trying. And I think so many of us can see our own family stories in hers. So, of course, I was interested. I, my father is from North Carolina, and my mother is from the Caribbean, which I always thought, oh, goodness, that's hard, so I'm not going to, that's harder to do. But I would joke with my father, I have an hour for you today, okay, because the rest of my time is, is Michelle's. Um, <laughs> Um, but I did do a little bit of digging, and um, I was actually in uh, Chicago in, at the Newberry Library, which is a wonderful, wonderful resource um, if any of you happen to go that way. And one of the things that I was uh, hoping to do was to find who in the First Lady's family was the fir first to vote, if, there, if it was possible. It was one of those efforts that went nowhere. Um, but anyway, uh, there was a book there of voter registration records uh, from North Carolina um, in 1867. And I looked uh, for some of these, um, a jumper family that lived on both sides of the Virginia-North Carolina border to see if I could find any of them. Not there. Um, but I did find my great-great-great-grandfather, who was in his 40s in 1867 when he registered to vote just two years after slavery. Um, didn't say whether he did vote or who he voted for, um, but it said that he was accepted as a voter, and it is the oldest record that I have on my father's side. On my mother's side, um, on speaking to the DNA, uh, finally this spring I thought, you know, I've been testing everyone in the world, I should just, why don't I do it? And um, I did, and what was remarkable, if, if you do these tests, you know, they you do the cheek swab and they give you your kind of ethnic map, um, but they also throw you into this database with other people who have also done DNA testing, and some of them are relatively large, and you figure, have matches sometimes with those folks. And um, astonishingly enough, I had a lot of um, matches with folks who were from my mother's side of the family, people from... Um, the Bahamas, and they kind of handed my mother's family tree to me on a platter. They've been spending years uh, doing that. And so on my mother's side, I am very close to, um, you know, knowing who the, um, I guess it may be four greats, um, uh, who was a, a slave owner. The, he, they basically, the white ancestors in my family were British loyalists who fled after the Revolutionary War and were granted um, 
land um, in, um, in the colonies, in the Bahamas. And so, like the First Lady, and like so many people, I am the descendant of slaves and slave owners. Trying to get as many questions as I can. Um, my name is Jessica, and I, I've been reading a lot of books. Sorry. Um, I've been reading a lot of books that take place during war time, particularly World War II, and you mentioned something that I kind of been thinking about sort of after the Civil War, after slavery ended, people were trying to find their brothers, their sisters, their husbands, their wives. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I'm kind of fascinated by that subject of how do people find each other? They didn't have the internet, they didn't have telephones to call right. each other, so what sort of resources did they use? This effort um, after the Civil War of people trying to find their lost people and how they did that at a time when there were none of the modern methods of communication. It's actually, it's enormously fascinating. And if you read, um, you know, the, the letters that people, people, people wrote or had people write letters, they put advertisements in the newspapers. Some of it's heartbreaking. Last saw, you know, Polly in 1840-something, eight years old. You know, people, people kept looking. People walked for miles and miles to wherever they were from, you know, to try and find people. And um, sometimes they were successful and sometimes they were not. Um, there's quite a lovely novel um, called Freeman out now by another journalist I know, which um, talks about one man's search to find, um, after slavery, to find his wife that was lost. And um, it was quite, it's, it's really heart-wrenching when you read about it. Other questions? Uh, my name is Jody, and you said that they erected a statue or memorial for Melvinia. Was that because of your book? I mean, you know what happened? Actually, the, it got it's it got in motion after the article ran, um, and so it just so happened that um, my book was coming out. So the art the book came out about two and a half years after the. Um, article ran and it just so happened that it was this monument that they erected was coming out about the same time. And so it was, I, in fact, I didn't even have any idea that it was, they were doing that until about three months before the book came out. Hello, I'm Rita. Hi. Um, if a person wants to research their family history, where's, what's the first step? Where would we start? One Question. of the things that has really uh, I, I really ended up feeling so passionate about. I've ended up feeling like, you know, a preacher of the gospel of genealogy. I, I think what we really need to do is, you know, talk to our older people first, right now. You know, talk to your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles. Gather up any photos, records um, that they have. That's the first thing I would do, because I think for many of us, um, this interest comes um, after the people we would love most to ask are gone. Um, and then there are actually these days there are a lot of options and even for African Americans it's difficult but there's just much more out there than um, there was. So there are these search, you know, agency subscriber services, Ancestry.com for instance is one, Family Search is another that's free and um, if you have um, uh, you know, some solid information or a very unusual name you can kind of punch it in and see, you know, from your home computer, census records, marriage records, death records. Let me warn you that you may never, you know, get up from your computer again. <laughs> it's very, you become very obsessed. Um, but um, yeah, there, there are lots of ways to get started. And we could talk a little after if you were curious. This lady over here. Getting my exercise. <laughs> Hello, what's your name? Jacqueline Proctor. I'm from Baltimore, although I don't live here right now, but thank you very much for coming to the festival. I came home this weekend just for it. Oh, wow, thank uh, you. Um, I just wanted to ask, in terms of the overall impact of the book since it's been published, uh, what kind of uh, commentary have you gotten from the general public, and what do you think, if any, uh, your book will add to the overall discussion of uh, current racism, previous racism, but 
really to the whole effort of us really owning up both sides of, of, the, of the fence, so to speak, what the impact of slavery and racism uh, did to this country. I, you know, it's hard for me to say what kind of impact it has had. I am always grateful to see people out there when I go and talk. And like I said, having um, this family actually meet and, and talk to each other, I found very meaningful. Um, I, you know, I would hope that um, people will continue um, to do this kind of work and to have these kinds of discussions and that people will do that within their own families as well as, you know, um, with, with the community and across racial lines. I think that, um, I think it matters. I think it's not easy, but I think it matters. And I do, I do find encouraging that there is, sometimes it, I, I worked in South Africa for a while and um, in a lot of places, a woman mentioned the, the Holocaust too, a, a lot of places that have gone through really um, traumatic experiences. There is a period of time that it takes for people to be able to feel comfortable enough. I'd like to think that we are in one of those times. It's still difficult for people to talk about, um, but I hope that we won't shy away from our history just because it's difficult. Any other questions for Rachel? Yes. I can, add a, I can add a little bit to that last question. Uh, DNA uh, directed me to a Native American side of my family, the Pequots, and uh, they're the Foxwood Casino owners. Oh, wow. So I find that very fascinating to get back uh, comparing notes with a lot of Native Americans that are distant, distantly related to me. Did you have any idea? Did you have family stories at all of any Native American ancestry? They're being developed right now, yeah. yeah. Fascinating, yeah. Um, and another comment, too, I think the LDS is a great source it is, for somebody yeah. starting. Yeah, uh, I'm a volunteer there, and I can't say enough about them. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a member of the church, but it's a great free resource. Right, yeah. I think she's right back there. Hello again. Th this thought just came to me. Um, did you use any of the... Um, Gene genealogy records that are maintained by the Mormon Church. And, and this is what he was is there, referring did to. You just, oh, I couldn't yeah, hear. Just I was because. listening to the music, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, the, he, he, this uh, gentleman here was just referring to uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, and he's saying he's not a member, but wow, they have amazing records, and they are. Family Search, I feel like Family Search is affiliated, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but um, they do have a great deal of, of um, they've sp spent a lot of time uh, digitizing records and making records available, so it is a great place to look. First of all, I loved your writing when you read the Thank way you. you wrote. It was beautiful. I'm appalled with what this uh, Senator Brown's doing to uh, Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts. Over, you know, what I'm talking about the mm -hmm. Indian. I'm from the part of the country where a lot of people had Indian access ancestors, but they hid it for so many generations, and then there's that period where they start being proud that they have it. Uh, one is, uh, what I wanted to know, did you find any Native Americans? That's a good question. And yes, um, well, hints of it anyway. Um, I mentioned um, the Illinois ancestors who had deep roots in Illinois, and I, I have, um, um, I have some lovely photos in the book. If you're interested, you can come by afterwards. But the First Lady's great-great-grandmother who arrived so early in Illinois, if you look at her, you would definitely think there's some Native American ancestry there. And the family story is that she was part Cherokee. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, on her mother's side, um, this Jumper family that I mentioned lived on the Virginia-North Carolina border. That was the family that lived um, free for generations, um, for decades rather, before the Civil War. I never could figure out how they came to be free. They were mixed race people, um, but there was one tantalizing um, bit of information. There was a, a woman uh, who shared the same name who lived very close by these counties where I, you know, I was able to establish a direct line. And Hagar Jumper in the 1700s, late 1700s, went to court and, um, and you know, petitioned for her freedom based on her Native American ancestry, and she won. 
And so um, the question I have was, you know, was that how that family became free? I was never able to connect Hagar Jumper with the, directly with the First Lady's Jumper, so I don't know, but it could be. And they were Tuscarora. There's a group of people in Kentucky, and I, I don't get the exact name, like Munchians. Oh, the Melungeons, yeah. And that was the case with that, uh, that she went to court with the same kind of story. Right. I right. think in the 70, late 1700s, there was interesting, after the Revolutionary War, there was a lot of fervor for a time, even among, you know, idealism about, well, the rights of man and all of that. And, and, and African Americans went to court and said, this is wrong. And some slave owners said, how can we, you know, we just fought this war and all these ideals and some of them freed their slaves. Um, but that spirit did not last for long. <laughs> Other questions for Rachel? Well, I'm, I'm curious to know what uh, is the age of the oldest living descendant? of Michelle Obama. Uh, of, of Melvinia and uh, the White Shields family? Probably... Um, living today. Living Obviously. today, yeah. <laughs> Jewel Barkley, who was Dolphus's great-granddaughter, is about 84. And I'm trying to think of the, the white ancestors. Um, probably the oldest one um, alive is Charles's granddaughter. That's Henry's son, Charles. And he has a granddaughter who is also in her 80s who is still alive. Okay. I yeah. have a 91-year-old grandmother. So you, you got me starting yeah. to think. Like, yeah, talk to, to her. Talk, yeah, <laughs> talk to, to her. Yeah. Other questions for Rachel? Oh. <laughs> you got a ton of questions, don't you? <laughs> it is fascinating. So will you do the same type of book for President Barack Obama? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, you know, I, I took two years um, uh, to do this, which in um, you know the uh, literary world is like warp speed, um, but for me was quite a lot of time away from my day job. Um, so I am back at work at the New York Times. Um, I would love to write another book at some point, and I, I must say I was transfixed by the history. It was hard. I used to tell myself, you know, I've got to get myself out of the 19th century, move this family to Chicago, but. Um, I'd like to think that um, perhaps um, if there is another book that it will be dealing with history in some way. I want to thank everyone for coming. I think there are books to be bought and signed if you're interested. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Rachel.